Greetings and welcome to the AMC Entertainment Holdings, Inc. First quarter 2024 earnings webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone wants to require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, John Merriweather, Vice President, Capital Markets and IR. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to AMC's first quarter 2024 earnings webcast. With me this afternoon is Adam Aaron, our chairman and CEO, and Sean Goodman, our chief financial officer. Before I turn the webcast over to Adam, let me remind everyone that some of the comments made by management during this webcast may contain forward-looking statements that are based on management's current expectations. Numerous risks, uncertainties, and other factors may cause actual results to differ materially from those that might be expressed today. Many of these risks and uncertainties are discussed in our most recent public filings, including our most recently filed 10Q and 10K. Several of the factors that will determine the company's future results are beyond the ability of the company to control or predict. In light of the uncertainties inherent in any forward-looking statements, listeners are cautioned against relying on these statements. The company undertakes no obligation to revise or update any forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information or future events. On this webcast, we may reference non-GAAP financial numbers, uh, measures, such as adjusted EBITDA, constant currency, uh, free cash flow, uh, uh, among others. For a full reconciliation of our non-GAAP measures to GAAP results, please see our earnings release posted in the Investor Relations section of our website earlier this afternoon. After our prepared remarks, there will be a question and answer session. <clears throat> this, question, this afternoon's webcast is being recorded and a replay will be available in the Investor Relations section of our website at amctheaters.com later today. With that, I'll turn the call over to Adam. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, one and all, and thank you for joining us today. Against the backdrop of an industry box office that was hampered by Hollywood's strike-induced production delays, AMC once again outperformed. We exceeded Wall Street expectations for total revenues, adjusted EBITDA, net income, and diluted earnings per share. It was no surprise to most astute observers that the number of major film releases in the first quarter of 2024 would be greatly reduced because of production delays caused by the five months long actors and writers strikes of 2023 in Hollywood. Indeed, we saw that one major studio had its first quarter domestic box office revenues decrease by an astounding 98% compared to the first quarter of 2023. That studio's decline was not because of some strategic shift to streaming or a, disinterested by, a disinterest by consumers in going to movie theaters. It was solely because they were not able to release new films into the market due to the, the actors and writers strikes of uh, midsummer last year. However, at AMC, we were heartened by several important events in the first quarter. First, that movie going bounced back in March, which was a considerably stronger month than January or February. Second, that our company's intensive review of the movies coming out later in 2024, 2025, and 2026 suggest, in our view, that very good times are ahead for the movie theater industry. And third, that our company, AMC Entertainment, performed so well in Q1, increasing our market share and continuing to become a more potent and more efficient operator. Notwithstanding a 6% decline in the quarter's North American box office compared to 2023, AMC's total revenue remained broadly in line with the prior year. And our per patron revenue and per patron profit continued along their stellar growth trajectory with all-time first quarter records achieved on these two metrics in our domestic business. 
At AMC in the quarter, our total revenue per patron was almost 36% above the pre-pandemic level in Q1 of 2019. And even more impressive is that our contribution margin per patron, defined as total revenue, less film exhibition costs, and less food and beverage costs, divided by the number of patrons, was almost 44% above pre-pandemic Q1 of 2019. These achievements are thanks to our relentless focus on enhancing the guest experience at our theaters, while at the same time driving efficiency in our operations. Through our resilience, resolve, creativity, and flexibility, AMC continues to adeptly navigate through changing and challenging circumstances. Our surging revenues per patron and surging profit per patron numbers are why at AMC we believe that there is now a path for AMC to achieve the same levels of EBITDA that we enjoyed pre-pandemic, even at lower levels of revenue. What's more, if and when the industry revenue does fully recover, we would then expect to be able to achieve substantially higher levels of EBITDA than we did in the past. Moviegoer sentiment is clear. Guests want to see movies on a huge silver screen, and they are consistently willing to pay more for the best possible experience. That certainly favors AMC, as we have more premium large format screens, namely IMAX, Dolby Cinema, and Prime, than any other cinema operator in the world. Consumers are also paying up for innovative food and beverage offerings, and AMC continues to outsell all our major competitors in F&B. All moviegoers also are now buying movie-themed merchandise from us online and at our concession stands in quantities that we have never before seen. Enough said from me about the first quarter of 2024 because my focus is not on a strike that impacted January and February uh, movie releases. It is instead on two other things. First, it's not the movies that were not released in January and February. It is instead the movie slate that is coming over the next two years to two and a half years. I am more optimistic now about the future of movie theaters than I have ever been. And that's because of the movie slate that's coming, especially towards the end of 2024, in 2025, and again in the first half of 26, which hold, in my opinion, great promise. Second, I'm paying great attention to our cash reserves. I've said over and over again on these calls and webcasts that cash is king and that the smartest thing AMC has ever done since COVID hit in 2020 was to make sure that our cash reserves at AMC were robust while other theater operators fell by the wayside. To that end, it is so energizing and so reassuring that we had $624 million of unrestricted cash at the end of Q1 and that AMC has raised yet another $124.1 million of equity capital since March 31. With cash in the bank, we are better prepared to weather any storm. But fortunately, storms do end. As a result, we see the box office turning an important corner later this year and again in full year 2025. This is not just AMC's view. Having recently returned from our industry's largest and most important annual gathering, CinemaCon, the positive energy in the air was palpable. One studio after another confirmed that film production was once again in full motion. 
that they were eager to bring more titles to the silver screen, and that the value of theatrical exhibition has never been more evident. I'm not going to regale you on this webcast with all the titles of the cavalcade of big movies that are coming, but they are indeed coming. And it all starts in just a few months with a great slate of movies exclusively for theatrical exhibition. They include new characters and captivating storylines, along with familiar faces and popular franchises. When I look at year-end 2024, and especially at full year 2025, and I see an industry box office, I don't think I should say yet, hallelujah, let the good times roll. But I can finally say with confidence, hallelujah, let the significantly better times roll. Things are looking up as we look ahead. I'll now pass this webcast over to Sean to provide more details on our financial results just released, after which I'll return to update you on some key initiatives before taking questions from our sell side analysts and from our retail shareholders. Sean? Thanks, Adam. And thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. The box office in the first quarter was impacted by last year's Hollywood strikes. Despite a 6% decline in the North American box office compared to G1 of 2023, AMC was able to maintain total revenue within 1% of last year's first quarter. This was achieved thanks to the North American market share growing by over 70 basis points more than any other top 50 theater operator, solid attendance growth in our European business of approximately 6%, and total revenue per patron growth of 1.8%. Now looking at our domestic segment and comparing the first quarter of 2024 to Q1 of 2023, with the box office down by approximately 6%, our admissions revenue declined by 3.2%, outperforming the industry, and total revenue declined by only 2.2%. Total revenue per patron increased by 3.8%, with admissions revenue per patron up by 2.7%, and food and beverage revenue per patron up by 1.2%. These per patron metrics were all-time first quarter records for AMC, and our total revenue per patron was some 43% ahead of the first quarter of pre-pandemic 2019. In addition, our contribution margin per patron, which we define as total revenue, less film exhibition costs, and less food and beverage costs, divided by the number of guests, was $15.32. This is 5% above the first quarter of 2023 and 54% above the first quarter of pre-pandemic 2019. These strong per patron metrics are as a result of the continued success of our innovative market-leading food and beverage offerings, as well as our alternative content and immersive DALF offerings, and revenue diversification initiatives such as retail popcorn. Add to this our ongoing theater portfolio rationalization and thoughtful expense management, and we end up with record-setting results. Now looking at our international segment and comparing the first quarter of 2024 to Q1 of 2023, this is all in constant currency. Admissions revenue increased by 3.7% and total revenue increased by 2.8%. Total revenue per patron declined by 2.9% with admissions revenue per patron down by 2% and food and beverage revenue per patron down by 1.4%. Note that total revenue per patron was 27.8% ahead of the first quarter of pre-pandemic 2019. Contribution margin per patron was 3.6% below the first quarter of 2023, up 30.3% above the first quarter of pre-pandemic 2019. Our international per patron metrics this quarter were adversely impacted by country mix, with relatively strong attendance growth 
in the traditionally lower revenue per patron market of Italy, coupled with attendance declines in the traditionally higher revenue per patron markets of Sweden and Germany. In addition, while our European attendance benefited from strong local content offerings, particularly in Finland, Germany, Italy, and Sweden, such content is associated with lower PLF mix and lower revenue per patron. As we continue along our recovery glide path, we will maintain our focus on providing a differentiated, high-value guest experience at our theaters across the globe and profitable revenue growth through diversification initiatives such as retail, pop, retail popcorn, AMC branded candy, and the distribution of alternative content. All of this while paying very close attention to our overall operating efficiency. Now moving to cash flow and the balance sheet, we ended the quarter, the first quarter of 2024, with unrestricted cash of $624.2 million, which translates into $188.3 million of net cash used in operating activities for the quarter. This is broadly in line with the net cash used in operating activities in Q1 of 2023. CapEx, net of landlord contributions, was $46 million in the first quarter. We continue to expect net CapEx in 2024 to be in the range of $175 to $225 million. From a theater portfolio perspective, we continue to actively manage our footprint. During the first quarter, we closed four underperforming locations, and we added one new high-performing theater. This will bring the total number of locations closed since the pandemic began to 169, and the total number of new locations opened to 60 for a net reduction of 109 locations, or 10.9% of our locations at December 31st, 2019. And we continue to see that the 60 new locations clearly outperform the 169 closed locations. To ensure our ongoing recovery and position us to thrive as our industry grows, our top two capital allocation priorities must remain. Number one, we must ensure that we have sufficient liquidity to manage through our recovery phase, including the impact of last year's Hollywood strikes. And number two, we must strengthen our balance sheet by extending debt maturities and improving our financial leverage. During the first quarter, we exchanged $17.5 million of debt for roughly 2.5 million shares of common stock, recording a profit of $5.8 million. And we also repaid approximately $8.4 million of deferred rent. The deferred rent balance at the end of Q1 was $47.9 million, and we would plan to reduce this balance by another approximately $12 million by the end of 2024. Thus far, during the second quarter of 2024, we have raised $124.1 million of gross equity proceeds, excluding commissions and fees, through the sale of approximately $38.5 million shares under our existing ATM or at-the-market offering program. So overall, since the beginning of 2022, so over the last 2.3 years, we have raised nearly $1.2 billion of gross equity capital. We've lowered the principal value of our debt and finance leases by $707 million through debt repayments, repurchases, or exchanges of debt for equity. And we've repaid $267 million of deferred leases. This all for a total reduction of debt and deferred leases of $974 million. This debt reduction has also lowered our annual cash interest expense by approximately $60 million. These actions have prepared us to face with confidence a relatively weak box office in the first half of 2024. And while the second quarter is forecast to be well below 2023's record second quarter. That quarter benefited from the tremendous success of titles such as Super Mario Brothers, Guardians of the Galaxy, and, and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. We are increasingly enthusiastic about the second half of the year and a return to a strong and vibrant post-pandemic growth trajectory. And now I'll hand 
the web cost back over to Adam. Thank you, Sean. Before taking your questions, I'd like to bring you all up to date on five ongoing initiatives at AMC. First is our continuing dialogue with several of the world's greatest musical artists. As you know, for the first time in our company's history, in late 2023, we surprised the world with our Taylor Swift and Beyonce concert films. That appears to be the gift that keeps on giving. Because ever since, we've been in conversation with artist after artist after artist after artist. Some of the biggest names who routinely fill arenas and stadiums the world over. That has led to an announcement just yesterday of our collaboration with nine-time Grammy winner and two-time Academy Award winner Billie Eilish in partnership with Apple Music and Interscope Records, next week, on May 16 and 17, our AMC Theater Dolby Cinemas will be an integral part of the launch of her new album, Hit Me Hard and Soft. In a special listening event, Billie Eilish fans will be able to hear the new album in Dolby Atmos Sound exclusively at AMC Theaters the day before the album is released to the public. <laughs> the visual content on screen has been carefully selected to delight those in attendance. This is just the beginning of the innovative programming that will be coming to our theaters from our new distribution arm, AMC Theaters Distribution. <laughs> While the Billie Eilish listening event will take place only at AMC locations, we took great pride that so many of our fellow movie theater operators were included in our efforts with Taylor Swift and Beyonce. We expect going forward that some of our activity in this sphere will be exclusively held at AMC locations only, and that other activity cooperatively will be shared across our entire industry. Second, let's talk briefly about the success of AMC's Retail Popcorn Initiative, which just now has celebrated its one-year anniversary. Initially offered exclusively at Walmart with ready-to-eat popcorn at just 550 locations, but within weeks thereafter, we introduced our microwave popcorn varieties and we expanded to some 2,600 Walmart stores, as well as to Walmart.com. Sales have been brisk, and more and more retailers have decided to carry our branded popcorn for the home. Today, AMC's Perfectly Popcorn is now sold at 6,500 points of distribution, or nearly 12 times as many locations as when we first launched a year ago. We've added Amazon.com as well, and grocery juggernauts Publix and Kroger to our distribution channels. And we are ambitiously pursuing further growth, adding more grocery chains as we look ahead uh, later this year and next. The third topic to discuss today is our exploding food and beverage sales numbers, which lead the industry among major operators in the United States. Naturally, we're pleased that the New York State Legislature just weeks ago agreed to allow movie theaters to serve alcohol, a ban that has been in place for almost a century, believe it or not. This means for us that we can have lucrative liquor sales at 30 more AMC movie theaters across the state of New York. Beyond that, our culinary team continues to work passionately on innovative in-theater food and beverage offerings. For example, at more than 400 AMC theaters across the country in the United States, we've just added new, fresh donut hole offerings in multiple flavors to sweeten the movie-going experience. The Baker's Dozen shareable donut holes come in three heavenly flavors, cinnamon sugar, strawberry, 
and our proprietary peanut butter blend created in partnership with PB2. Every serving comes with a container of warm icing to make each bite even sweeter and to add just a few calories to this neat little offering at AMC. These things might look like donut holes to our guests, but to us, they look like incremental dollars. We expect to sell a lot. Similarly, we're innovating at our 50 dine-in theaters as well, where guests are served a more comprehensive food and beverage menu. We've added four entirely new offerings, new artisan pizzas with five different toppings, two new chicken sandwich choices, each nestled on a toasted brioche bun, a new Caesar, a new Caesar salad with chicken to complement our already popular Cobb salad. And last but certainly not least, again, to satisfy those sweet tooth or teeth, we've introduced milkshakes in five flavors, including chocolate with Ghirardelli chocolate syrup, vanilla, strawberry, peanut butter with a Reese's peanut butter sauce, and an Oreo shake with Oreo cookie pieces mixed in. It's no accident that AMC Food and Beverage leads the way in our industry. We devote substantial resources to imaginatively understanding the flavor palette and the diverse tastes and appetites of AMC moviegoers. The fourth topic to discuss quickly, at our European theaters, we have just introduced an intriguing innovation, which we've named XL. We have branded more than 60 of our larger screen auditoriums, but screens that would not necessarily qualify as a premium large format. We've given them an XL name, XL for extra large, of course, and gently nudge into the market a small premium price in these auditoriums. We're watching the success of this new product very closely to see if we should expand the concept further in Europe and or to our US theaters as well. And finally, fifth, we are taking our AMC Investor Connect program very seriously, both to reward our shareholders and to stimulate added patronage at our theaters from the more than one million members in this program. In the summer of 2021, AMC launched AMC Investor Connect of the first of a first of its kind program in which our shareholders were invited to enroll so that we could engage directly with them. Investor benefits to our retail shareholders through AMC Investor Connect have included shareholder exclusive promotions, NFTs, free or discounted items, invitations, special screenings, and communications directly from me as CEO of the business. Our continued commitment to AMC Investor Connect recognize the important role that our retail shareholders have played in getting AMC through these past difficult COVID and strike impacted years, and the program is designed to provide them with truly exclusive rewards and benefits. Especially knowing that there are many retail shareholders listening to this webcast right now, can I remind you all that at 7 p.m. local time tonight, in our IMAX Dolby Cinema and AMC Prime Auditoriums, we are offering a special advanced screening of Disney's stunning new movie, that's right, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which opens to the general public this weekend. We hope you enjoy it. Now it's time to take your questions, but before I do, here are our final thoughts on the first quarter and our near and longer term prospects. In the first quarter, AMC exceeded all expectations, a quarter that admittedly was impacted by last year's Hollywood strikes. The second quarter's box office, while likely uh, will be sequentially stronger and bigger than Q1, but it will still, too, be impacted by the strikes of last year, 
and will fall significantly below last year's second quarter because last year's second quarter just happened to be the single strongest quarter in all of 2023. However, when we speak again in August, after the second quarter is in the books, based on what we know today, we believe that the summer box office will be strong, healthy, and growing. AMC is poised handsomely to benefit as our movie-going audience will be thoroughly entertained next summer by titles playing at an AMC theater near you, including Disney's Deadpool and Wolverine and Universal's Despicable Me 4 and Twisters. And looking beyond just the summer, we similarly are excited about what we anticipate for the fourth quarter with such blockbusters title, titles as Warner Brothers' Joker, Folly Adieu, Universal's Wicked, bringing to the screen the Broadway musical that has run for decades, and more, like Disney's Mufasa the Lion King and Sony's Venom the Last Dance. I could go on and on and on about the movies that are coming in 2024. But not only are we confident about it in the second half of 2024, we are also literally enthralled about an accelerating box office recovery as we head into 2025 and on into 2026. The box office in 2025 should be materially stronger than it has been in several years. AMC continues to be resilient, leveraging innovation, as well as hard and smart work to navigate through, navigate through these turbulent times. We have positioned ourselves not only to survive in troubled waters, but also to thrive as our industry grows. And as we look at 2025, we believe that our industry will again grow. We think the future, therefore, looks very bright. With that, Sean, let's move to questions. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, you can. Go ahead, Joe. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad, and a confirmation tone will indicate your line is on the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. And our first question comes from the line of Jim Goss with Barrington Research. Please proceed. All right, thanks. Um, Adam, regarding your discussion about uh, food and beverage initiatives, um, clearly dollars are more important than margin percentages, but I wonder if you could talk about how you think in terms of introducing items and the pricing attached to those items and where you feel uh, the uh, food and beverage margin should uh, settle in. It slipped a little bit in the last quarters for some of the reasons that have taken place. So, Jim, we're, we're picking up increased food and beverage sales sort of, of staggering numbers. You know, pre-pandemic, routinely, uh, food and beverage sales per patron were, were about $5 ahead at AMC. Um, I'm using the domestic numbers as a placeholder, not the European numbers. The European numbers are a little bit less than the U.S. numbers. And they shot up to around 8 to $9 ahead post-pandemic. So we're looking at a huge increase. And our F&B margins are in the low 80s. Uh, you know, it varies item by item and quarter by quarter, but my rule of thumb is about 82% of incremental food and beverage sales uh, flows to the bottom line. Uh, so when we, when we pop a $4 increase in food and beverage spending over where we were a few years ago, like that, that's, a, that's a huge driver of, of income for us. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that our revenue per patron is up so much. It's one of the reasons our profit per patron numbers are up so much. 
Um, and it really comes from three factors, or maybe I should say four factors. One, uh, we have slightly and only slightly raised the prices on our F and B products. Second, though, more and more people are stopping at our concession stands and buying food and beverage uh, items from us. The you know there is no rule that says you have to buy food or drink when you come into a movie theater. You can't just buy the ticket, go to your chair, enjoy it, enjoy the movie, and leave. Um, but what we have seen uh, over the last couple of years is that we're doing a much better job in capturing more people to stop the concession stand and buy. The third factor is they're buying more items. So where they, where someone used to buy one item, maybe they're buying two. If they're buying a drink and a popcorn, maybe they're buying a third item as well. If they're buying three items and four, now they're stock it up and buy and for. Uh, if there are multiple people in the party, maybe more people uh, in the party are taking items individually in the theater. There, and then the fourth item, and this is one of the issues that might affect food and beverage margins a little bit, are merchandise sales at the concession stands, which are not uh, as high a margin as 82%. But they're still very attractive margins. Um, uh, three or four years ago, we didn't have any merchandise sales at our concession stands, like literally zero. In calendar year 23, we had 54 million dollars in merchandise sales just at our U.S. theaters. Uh, so that might affect the margins a little bit. Um, but uh, as I said. This whole area has been one of staggering success for us. Uh, we've given our food and beverage organization more staffing, more resources uh, to run our F&B business. We've asked of them to uh, launch innovative new products in our theaters, at our dining, our theaters, you know, at our concession stands, at our, our regular theaters, uh, and so far so good. Uh, we're we're quite optimistic that this growth will continue and that the margins are going to stay real high. Um, you know, I have often said uh, you can do very well when you're selling air and water, air being popcorn and water being Coca-Cola. Um, uh, so, you know, this the whole industry has been pretty successful in improving its F&B uh, numbers over the last few years, but AMC has really led the way. We've outpaced everybody else. Okay, thanks. And just one other one. Um, and if we use the Billie Eilish uh, concert as a or a pre-recorded concert as a, an example, is this something you think you could then share with cinema competitors, or would that is that a just a one and done sort of thing, or could you do a limited run at AMC like every Wednesday or something of that nature to take advantage of it? but not interfere with your first-run theater or first-run films? So uh, when you talk about every Wednesday, that means 52 Wednesdays. Well, or not with necessarily. Nine, some, with some a, pattern. With, no, I know. But what I was about to say, with nine Grammys and two Oscars, um, there aren't 52 Billy Eilishes. So I don't, uh, and it's a tremendous amount of work to get these artists uh, to agree to uh, showcase their talent in our theaters, but that having been said, that having been said, I don't think we'll be doing 52 a year of them. But I do think that we'll be doing several per year, um, uh, e even a one-time listening event is lucrative for us on a per-screen basis. And of course, the Taylor Swift and Beyonce concert films uh, were enormous for AMC. They represented more than 15% of our total profitability for the year last year, if you look at the EBITDA they generated. Um, I, I do think that many of the, uh, I do think that, um, as I, well, I, look, I don't think, I know from having talked to so many um, uh, 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 people who are, 
either the artists themselves are representing the artists, uh, that there's a lot of interest in the movie industry generally based on what we pulled off collectively for Taylor and for Beyonce. Uh, I would expect several uh, major projects a year. I'm really excited about this uh, listening event for Billie Eilish because it's not a concert film. It's her new album release, which they put some visuals to. Um, you know, is, is it possible that a lot of major artists will look to movie theaters as an intriguing way uh, to launch their albums and to get garner extra publicity and fan interest, especially auditoriums equipped with something as uh, 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 industry leading as Dolby Atmos Sound. Uh, our, uh, we put together the Billie Eilish thing uh, with pretty tight uh, uh, timing. So it really wasn't practical to try to take this one to our competitors. But the success of Taylor and Beyonce was that we did take it to our competitors. It wasn't just an AMC thing. It was an industry thing. We had a very good market share, but it was, a, it was an industry-wide effort. And we're, we're going to be working very hard with our fellow movie theater operators uh, through AMC Theater Distribution, our distribution arm. Uh, to offer experiences not only at AMC, but also to take them to our competitors' theaters as well. So I really think it's a, uh, an industry-wide opportunity, but uh, AMC is uh, blazing a new trail, and we're way out in front. So I, and the summary is some of it we'll wind up doing ourselves alone, exclusively, and others we will uh, certainly take to our competitors. I have to say, this is one circumstance where our competitors have been fabulous to work with. You know, we fight like cats and dogs all year long, but on pulling off Taylor Swift and pulling off Beyonce, so many of the names that you would record recognize as major theater chains in the U.S., in Canada, in Mexico, in Europe, and globally, uh, were, our, were our, uh, our, our best possible partners in this effort, and we would expect to be able to bring more such experiences to them uh, either later in 2024 or uh, uh, in 2025. All right. Well, thanks very much for taking my questions. Thank you, Jim. And the next question comes from the line of Alicia Reese with Wedbush Securities. Please proceed. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm looking at um, the dynamics around market share in film rent, and so I'm just looking at, you know, there are a few titles in the quarter that drove most of the box office, particularly domestically, and a lot of that coming from Dune, which presumably led your market share games in the quarter, as you have the largest footprint of IMAX screens, and that played very well on IMAX. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk um, at least qualitatively about the dynamics uh, that drove your film rent um, substantially lower year over year. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll throw in something and Sean will take it uh, in addition. Uh, if you look at the first quarter, um, uh, there were fewer big blockbuster films and more middle-sized films that were in our theaters that did really well. And if you look at the, you know, we've never really disclosed our deal studio by studio, but they tend to be on sliding scales where uh, studios command a higher film rent on higher grossing films. Uh, and the fact that there were so many middle size and smaller films that led the way in the first quarter, that explains uh, a lot of why the film rent uh, reduction was achieved by AMC. Right? Anything? Yeah, so I'll just give you a little bit uh, more color. Um, so when we look at the number of titles that we played in Q1 2024, over $5 million, we had uh, 41 in Q1 versus 35 in Q1 2023. Um, and obviously the box office uh, was lower in 24 than 2023. So yes, June was a the biggest title of the quarter, most significant. But after June, um, the box office um, per title went down quite significantly. And so it's exactly as Adam says, you know, when the um, films have a lower gross uh, per showing, 
that uh, certainly impacts our firm rent uh, favorably. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions on the audio line. I would like to turn the call back to management for retail shareholder questions. Thank you, operator. Uh, okay, Sean, so what questions have come in from our retail shareholders? So the, uh, the first question is related to market share as well. And the question says that, you know, AMC has been growing market share in the U.S. market while at the same time closing under performing theaters. So um, can you comment about what uh, we can attribute this success to? And do we see this market share growth as sustainable as the industry recovers? Sure. So, yeah, it's a pretty impressive trick to increase your market share when you're closing 100 theaters. Um, but that's exactly what we did. And um, uh, uh, part of it is, and as you mentioned in your earlier remarks, our 70 basis point improvement in market share with a higher market share growth than was achieved by any of the 50 largest movie theater circuits uh, in the United States. Uh, that's very encouraging for us. Part of it is because we think our theaters are in good shape. Part of it is because uh, we think we've got very strong marketing, which I'll talk about later. Um, but also, What's really interesting is that the theaters that we are closing were our older, more tired theaters, buildings that were sort of at the end of their 20 or 30 year useful lives that weren't grossing all that much. And the theaters that we opened were shiny new ones in great locations, usually open with reclining seats to, to start, and as it turns out, it's incredible, but true, the 60 theaters that we opened outgrossed the 169 theaters that we closed. So we're replacing uh, older, tired, unsuccessful theaters with uh, thriving ones. And uh, some of the ones that we've opened are amongst our, literally, our highest grossing, most profitable theaters uh, in all of Europe and in all of the United States. Terrific. Um, and the next question is about AMC Cinema Suites. Um, question here is looking for an update on Cinema Suites, and is there a chance that we release these uh, products on the retail channel? So Cinema Suites is doing great. Uh, we're, we're very pleased. Uh, as you all know, I, I think it was in the fourth <laughs> quarter of 2023, we unveiled a proprietary house brand of premium gourmet candies, uh, chocolate-covered peanuts, chocolate-covered raisins, chocolate-covered almonds, uh, chocolate-covered pretzels, four, four different SKUs. Um, we say they're premium gourmet candies because they have a lot more chocolate, and we tend to charge the same price uh, for our Cinema Suites, as is as we charge what I might call regular branded candies that everybody on those loves. Um, they've been selling well. Um, uh, we've been um, they're 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 nicely ahead of expectations. Uh, we've had no problem with the supply chain and and getting these delivered to us in quantity. And I would think that we would, in fact take them to the retail market at some point going forward. Exactly when, I don't know. It's not the highest priority. There are other things that are higher on the list of things to do to make more money for AMC, uh, but Cinema Suites have done great. We're glad, we glad, we, we're glad we did it. Great, and then the next question is about our capital expenditure. Uh, can we pro provide some color on AMC's CapEx spend? Where are we allocating the money? Well, since your nickname around here is Dr. No and you're the one <laughs> that's the fashion of capital, and we've done everything in our power not to spend capital expenditures at the moment, because our preference has been to build up our cash reserves uh, for a rainy day, why don't you answer the CapEx question? Thanks, Adam. Well, it's true we are very disciplined in our capital spend, particularly during this recovery period. 
But the good news is that AMC has a very large number of high return investment opportunities. Right now, we are prioritizing those investments um, that maintain our existing buildings, our existing equipment, our IT capabilities, so that we can continue to provide the best possible guest uh, experience. But we're always allocating our capital to the best risk-adjusted return opportunities, and we continue to uh, do that. Um, when I look to the future, and, and I see sort of the pipeline of attractive investment opportunities we have, you know, they include our premium large format auditoriums, sight and sound upgrades, automation of the guest experience, theater feeding, et cetera. So again, there are many very attractive opportunities, but now around 75% of our um, capital spend is really focused on attaining the assets uh, to continue to provide uh, the best possible guest experience. Thank you, Sean. I, and I might add that you know, I, I think the priority uh, of spending has been maintenance capex first because uh, we have to keep our theaters in decent shape. Uh, but to the extent that we have additional monies in the door, our priority has been to use that to build up our cash reserves. Um, you know, the, my comments uh, uh, in my earlier prepared remarks of cash is king. It's a serious comment. Um, uh, I do believe that one of the reasons why AMC has uh, defied gravity the last four years and surprised a lot of people who thought we might run into trouble that we didn't is we build up our cash reserves intelligently. But having said that, there are so many interesting ways that we could reinvest in the business and I personally think the most lucrative of those ideas uh, is, as you said, the increased premium large format screens. I hope that we can add more IMAX screens and Dolby Cinema screens. We are the largest IMAX exhibitor in the world outside of China. We're the largest Dolby Cinema exhibitor in the world. We have about half of the IMAX locations in North America. We have all the Dolby Cinema locations in North America. Uh, those auditoriums do extremely well. And if we uh, can rustle up some capital expenditure money to do it, adding more of them is a, is a great idea. Agreed. Um, next question here is related to debt. Uh, the investor asks, with a significant amount of debt maturing in 2026, two years from now, what is the company doing to address this debt uh, that is maturing and reduce the overall debt level? So in terms of reducing the debt level, um, we have done, a, a, I think, a phenomenal job over the last few years of uh, paying down debt and other deferred obligations like deferred rent. Um, we, in the last two years, roughly, we've paid off almost a billion dollars of long-term debt and other deferred obligations, which is encouraging. Um, We've done that in part by buying a lot of debt back in the open market at a discount, which means you're doing it at a profit, which is also good. Um, still realizing we're, we are playing a capital allocation game of reducing debt, buying, buying in debt versus investing in the business through CapEx versus building up our cash reserves. It's a bit of an art form, which actually, Sean, you, you manage this process day to day. Um, but, uh, and, and we paid off or reduced so much of our debt and obligations, it is kind of staggering to me that we had to borrow about $2 billion to survive COVID. And yet, if you look today at our net debt, AMC's net debt today is less than it was just prior to COVID. So how is it possible that you know we had to borrow $2 billion to survive, and yet we have less debt today than we had going into COVID? And the answer, of course, is because we raised a lot of equity and we paid down debt, which is important for us to do. Looking forward, we still have about $4.5 billion of debt. Uh, not much matures before 2026, but there are huge maturities in 2026. And I can assure everyone listening to this call today that the management of this company 
which has been pretty smart in how we've navigated uh, uh, ourselves through uh, uh, the, the pandemic here to four and a, uh, a, 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 a leverage balance sheet without a lot of EBITDA here to four. Uh, that same management team is wholly focused on the debt maturities that are due in 2026. This is not something that we're going to look at next year or the year after that. Uh, we've been working with our board of directors and our investment banks for almost a year now in discussing the smartest ways to extend the maturities of our 2026 debt into future time periods. Um, the good news is that we have lender syndicates who generally like AMC, have worked with us before, are working with us now. I'm hopeful that we will come to some uh, conclusion that will allow us to push out the debt maturities from 2026 uh, into future periods. Uh, there's nothing to announce yet because there's nothing that's final or done yet. There's no agreement that's imminent, like it's going to be announced in you know, a day or a week. Uh, but it has our highest attention. Uh, we, we know about our obligations coming forward. We intend to refinance, if at all possible, and we're hopeful that we can do so uh, on attractive terms. Absolutely agreed. Um, and then the last question that we uh, have is relating to the upcoming shareholder meeting. Uh, there's a question here. I would like to vote at the upcoming shareholder meeting, but how do I vote? I've not received any proxy information. Well, I do hope you. I mean, I hope you all do vote. For those who own shares, that is. I hope you all do vote. Um, you know, in, in prior years, the voting numbers at AMC have been pretty low uh, uh, because it has been the habit of some retail investors not to vote. Uh, I would remind everybody, this is a chance to have your voices be heard. Uh, we pay attention to what you say in these shareholder votes. We act accordingly. Uh, you know that I reduced my own comp compensation this year uh, in response to what shareholders were saying in the so-called say, uh, uh, say on pay vo uh, vote. So we really do want you to vote. We want to hear what you're thinking. Uh, you, but the way you vote is you go to your broker where your shares are held and you get the proxy materials from your broker. Uh, if you haven't received proxy materials yet, I know that I've received mine as an AMC shareholder from several different brokers, but if you haven't received yours, you should call your broker, you should ask for your proxy materials. Uh, we do have a proxy advisor, a solicitor, uh, here in the United States called D.F. King. You can call D.F. King if you would like help. There's a toll-free number that's been set up, 1-800-859-8511. Let me repeat that, 1-800-859-8511. If you hold your shares to DRS, you get your proxy materials from the registrar, computer share. And I just might add, since I know that we have many international shareholders on who listen to these webcasts, we do know that voting in shareholder meetings for American companies is not as easy abroad as it is in the United States. And in some cases, it is impossible because some overseas brokerages do not facilitate getting proxy materials to shareholders. And we have discussed this at length. There is literally nothing that we can do as a single listener of the New York Stock Exchange to do anything about that. All we can do is suggest to you that you change brokers and change from a broker who will not get you proxy materials to a broker who will get you proxy materials. Uh, but as I said, we encourage you to vote. It's a good thing. Uh, uh, and uh, the shoulder meeting is, is coming not too far from now. With that, I think you're telling me we're done with questions. So we're going to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, 
I, I leave you with two simple thoughts. As we look at the box office for the end of this year and for next year and into 2026, the box office looks spectacular compared to what we've suffered with in 2020, 21, 22, and 23. Uh, and the second thing I'll leave you with is not too late. It's only 5 o'clock Central, 6 o'clock East. At 7 o'clock local time all across the country in our premium large formats is a special advanced screening of Planet, uh, our Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Uh, should be a pretty big movie this weekend. With that, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect your lines at this time.